Hey, I'm Kenya, and I'll share my story of how I survived living in an orphanage. But first, make sure to like this video and hit subscribe. If you do it, the fairy godmother will bless your life with love and money. So I've been living in the orphanage for as long as I can remember. All I know is that my mother is in jail and my dad died in a car accident. Life at the orphanage was normal, but a bit dull. All the children had one dream, which was getting adopted by a nice family. Yet when I was 10, a new manager, Mr. Johnson, took over the orphanage. And let me tell you, we could smell trouble coming just by looking at him. On his first day, he told all the kids to gather in the dining room, and when he did, he made his first announcement with a strict tone. From now on, all rules will be changed. Anyone who does not follow them will be sent to the isolation room. All the children gasped in fear, but I didn't take his words seriously. So I said to Anna, my friend, he is joking, isn't he? Then he yelled, who said that? Silence took over the room. No one said anything, but when he threatened one of the girls, she pointed at me. He told me to come forward and stand on the chair. Then he asked one of the teachers to bring some scissors. Then, to my complete horror, he started cutting my long, beautiful blonde hair while saying, This is what you get for interrupting me. No one should speak in my presence. Tears started falling down my eyes, and all the children were terrified. From that day on, life at the orphanage became horrible. We all felt like prisoners. We had to work for everything, and the only free time we got was the time we went to sleep. The only thing that made it fun was watching my crush Braxton. Braxton was so handsome and cute, but we weren't allowed to talk to each other because Mr. Johnson had a rule of no mixing between boys and girls. But one day, I opened my locker to take some clothes out. To my horror, I found Braxton there. He put his finger on his mouth as a signal for me not to say anything. But I whispered, What are you doing here? And he responded, I broke one of the windows outside and I thought the girl's locker room was the perfect hiding place. I wanted to reply, but we heard someone coming, so Braxton pulled my hand and dragged me inside. It was tight, and we stood across from each other. I felt my face burning and my heart pounding like crazy. Braxton, however, didn't care at all. He was listening carefully. Then our eyes met, and we blushed. He whispered, I think we can go out. I blushed and said, Yes, I will go out with you. But he laughed and said, No, I mean go out of the locker. I responded, But I'm serious. I would love to go out with you. We got out, and Braxton left through the window. And from that day on, Braxton and I started dating in secret. We started exchanging letters in secret and meeting in the locker where nobody knew where we were. But then the whole thing got exposed when one of the counselors noticed how the two of us were looking at each other. And one time, while we were hugging, she opened the locker's door and said, Oh, I see what's happening. Braxton and I were caught by surprise. She looked at us angrily and told us to follow her to the office. We sat there waiting for the punishment, but instead she said, Do you have any idea how much trouble you can get in by doing that? Braxton and I sat in silence feeling guilty. She let us out after half an hour of scolding. But when we got out, Braxton had a look of determination on his face. He turned to me and said, We need to leave this horrible place. I objected. We are only 16. We are too young. We won't be able to survive. But he insisted. We can manage. I'm leaving tonight. You have to come with me. Meet me at midnight in the yard. Braxton left me a bit confused. I thought about it all night, but I came to the conclusion that the orphanage would be depressing without him. So at midnight, I packed everything I wanted and met him in the yard. We managed to skip the surveillance cameras and ran away, but we didn't know where to go. We kept walking in the street till morning came. After having breakfast, Braxton suggested that we start looking for a job. We only had a hundred dollars that Braxton had managed to steal from one of the counselor's purses. We agreed to meet at the same spot several hours later, and we both went asking for jobs. But unfortunately, no one wanted to hire us because we were too young. At night, we managed to get a room in a motel. Oh my god, the smell is unbearable in the room! I said, feeling disgusted. Braxton, well, it's better than sleeping on the street. You'll get used to it. A week went by with both of us looking for a job. Braxton lied about his age and got a job at a fast food restaurant, but I wasn't as lucky as him. So at the end of that week, Braxton told me, Hey Kenya, we need to split up. I can't provide for the both of us anymore. I looked at his face. Braxton was dead serious, but I was enraged. You made me run away with you and now you want to give up that easy? What a jerk! I took my things and got out. I can't go back to the orphanage because Mr. Johnson will punish me and I have nowhere to go. I sat on the corner of the street wishing that someone would offer some help. Two days passed, but nothing happened. I was tired, 
and dirty. I ate only the leftovers people left on restaurant tables. I was exhausted. Then late at night, a good-looking young woman came and asked me, What are you doing here, young lady? I burst into tears. She was the first one to speak to me in two days. I responded, I have no one. I'm homeless. She felt sorry for me, but then she asked, I'm Carmen. I live on my own. I would love to have some company. Would you like to live with me? I couldn't resist her offer. I needed help, so I immediately said yes. The woman took me to her house. She offered me some food and I ate like a savage girl. She showed me to my room and I slept like a baby. However, the next day over breakfast, she said, You can't just live here for free. You have to work for it. I looked at her with a surprised look on my face, but she continued, Don't worry, it's a cleaning business. I clean rich people's houses and get paid for it. I'll pay you, of course. The whole thing looked tempting. I'll work and get some money. It doesn't seem so bad. But that's not what happened. On our first cleaning day, we went to this magnificent mansion. The owner gave the keys to Carmen and then went to play some golf. Carmen took some cleaning tools out and told me to sweep the floor while she went checking the rooms. I knew what she was doing was wrong, but I couldn't stop her. I kept cleaning silently. At the end of the day, the owner came back and handed Carmen $1,000. On our way home, Carmen took $200 and gave it to me and said, You've earned this. I looked at her with pure aversion. Carmen didn't help me at all. She left me to clean all by myself. I deserved half of that $1,000. But I was too exhausted to say anything, so I kept my mouth shut. But this kept on happening. I'd die cleaning those houses and Carmen would get paid for us both. I also noticed that she would hide things in her little bag. One time, when she was checking a painting on the wall, I opened the bag and noticed a diamond ring. I gasped and closed the bag as fast as I could. That night, I made my decision to steal. If I want to live a better life, I need to start making money. If Carmen does it, then I can do it too. So I started stealing small things from the houses. Little pieces of jewelry, small wooden antiques, and expensive gold pens. But I didn't keep them with me. I sold them by going to antique stores. I hid the money I got in a private place, and I showed Carmen that I was grateful for her hospitality, so she didn't suspect me. Things went like that for two years, until one night, we heard someone knock on the door. Carmen went to answer. It was the police. I shivered as the officer told her that she was under arrest. The owner of the last house we visited had caught her on camera stealing his wife's jewelry. When they left, I couldn't sit still. I packed my bags and got my money out. I decided to move out. I rented a tiny apartment for me and got back to working as the main cleaning lady. I mean, I knew all our clients, and now they would pay me good money that I wouldn't have to steal. And because I was so good at cleaning, I started getting more clients. One of them was called Robin. Robin was in his 20s and he was so hot. Whenever he was in the house, I couldn't take my eyes off him. There was one problem though. He was married. Weeks passed with me watching him. At first, he seemed like he didn't care. But then one afternoon while I was cleaning the kitchen, he came in and said, I know how you are feeling. I feel the same way too. I blushed and looked at him and said, Oh, really? He didn't answer. He just came and kissed me. Robin and I started dating in secret, and I thought that it was not that bad to steal from his house. After all, he was enjoying my company. Plus, he had rare expensive antiques. I stole a few and sold them. Robin was rich, but he was not dumb. Soon he found what I had done and yelled at me. How dare you steal these things? We pay you good money! I panicked, so I said, You know, I'm pregnant with your baby. His face went white. He totally believed me, so I made my second strike. If you want to get me out of your life, you need to pay two million dollars. Robin was scared. He clearly didn't want to ruin his relationship with his wife, so he said, Okay, fine, but you won't work here anymore. You are fired. I responded, I couldn't care less about working for you. I just need the money. I'll send you my bank account. So Robin started sending me money month by month. I was not pregnant, but I had to fake. I photoshopped some pregnancy photos and sent them to Robin. He kept messaging me. I don't want anything to do with you or with the baby. When it was time for me to give birth to my fake baby, I offered my neighbor to babysit her newborn. She was surprised, but she agreed quickly because she had errands to do. I took the newborn baby and went to Robin's workplace. He was nervous when he saw me. He told me to meet him in the parking lot so no one could see us. Robin said, What are you doing here? I paid you everything you asked for. 
I responded confidently. The baby and I need a house to live in. I can't stay in that old, dusty little apartment. Robin's face turned red. He was angry. But this time he said, I'll get you the house, but you will sign papers that release me from any further responsibilities. I will also get a restraining order against you. You'll no longer come near me or my house. I smiled and said, cool. And so Robin bought me a house outside the city in one of the nicest neighborhoods. I was beyond happy. I had a house and a lifetime of savings. I couldn't ask for more. But then three years later, while I was shopping for groceries, I heard a familiar voice saying, Oh my God, Kenya, is that you? I turned around and it was Braxton. He was taller, bigger, and extremely hot. All my feelings came rushing towards him. I forgot what he did to me and I ran to hug him. I said with pure excitement, Oh my God, Braxton, I miss you. Braxton looked impressed by my appearance. I could tell that he fell in love with me. We started talking and I invited him over to my house. I had to know what happened to him. However, Braxton was not as lucky or as smart as I was. He was still poor, barely making it from month to month. Don't worry, Braxton. You can stay here with me in this house. We can live together. Braxton was over the moon. He thanked me and then he asked, So how did you end up like this? I told him the whole story and he was proud of me. Braxton and I started living together, but it was not long until he asked me to marry him. I couldn't say no. I loved him from the bottom of my heart. We got married in a small ceremony. I was so happy. But later, I started to get worried because I couldn't have a baby. We tried so much, but it didn't work. And when we got to the doctor, he told me the biggest shock of my life. I'm sorry, but it seems that you can't have kids. I felt the world crashing down. I loved kids. I want to hold a baby of my own. When we got home, Braxton wasn't himself, so I asked, What's wrong? And he responded, Maybe we can't have kids because of what you did. Don't you think it's a punishment? I felt my blood boil. Was he judging me now? I left and went to my room. I couldn't stop thinking about what he said. When morning came, I had already made my decision. I told him over breakfast, I think you are right. I've done such horrible things. I'll donate half of my money to the orphanage. They need it. Braxton smiled and said, I'll make sure they receive it. I wrote a check and gave it to Braxton. I didn't want to go with him. The orphanage brought bad memories. I decided to wait for him in the house. I waited and waited, but Braxton never came back. I tried calling him multiple times, but his phone was out of reach. Where the hell did he go? I waited for Braxton two more days, but he never came back. I realized that he'd stolen the check and ran away. I felt so stupid, but that wasn't it. When I looked through his stuff to try and find something that might lead me to where he was hiding, I noticed two packs of pregnancy pills. He was giving them to me so I wouldn't get pregnant. That's why he was so determined to give me a glass of water before going to bed every day. I fell on the ground out of despair. 15 years later, I'm now 38. I lost everything I had because I got addicted to gambling. I'm so pathetic that no one wants to marry me. I'm thinking of becoming a nun and helping the orphans. Or maybe steal Mr. Johnson and take all of his money. Who knows what this head might come up with.